So with less than a week to go in that pivotal race for the governor's mansion in Virginia, a new poll out within the last hour finds a deadlock. The latest Watson, sentence, Watson Center survey shows former Democratic Governor Terry McAuliffe and Republican Glenn Youngkin in a dead heat, 49 to 48 percent, well within the poll's margin of error. It's worth noting the third party candidate, Princess Blanding, garners 1 percent. Another 1 percent are also undecided. Wow. It's that's a, it, really, it that's as close as it gets. Boy, it really is. Sam Stein, this race could go either way, obviously. It's going to be a battle for turnout. And you know, you Democrats have to be wondering uh, in a state that, you know, Joe Biden won by 10 points last year. Why is this race so difficult? But it is. Yeah, forgive me, my two-year-old child just burst in here crying, uh, so I'm a little I thought I heard that. <laughs> so cute. I thought that was you, Sam. Not, it, okay, it was me. Uh, yeah, not that, not that cute either. Uh, to your point, Joe, look, I, I, you can look at the historical trends. If you're the party in power, usually you have a tough time in these elections. Just in lack of enthusiasm, uh, the opposition tends to be more ignited. Um, but in this case, I think there are some particulars, uh, the national dynamics that are playing into this. One is Joe Biden's plummeting popularity rating is a real indicator of trouble for McCall. Uh, Democrats are not engaged. Uh, whatever momentum, legislative momentum may have been there early on uh, that had generated so much enthusiasm and excitement among all facets of the Democratic Party, that's gone. That's been sapped. Uh, and really what you're seeing is a lingering sort of lamaze, basically, from the COVID fight, where people are just saying you should be out of this pandemic, it should be going better. Uh, you look at all the public polling data, and that's really where uh, the Democratic Party and Biden in particular are struggling. So McAuliffe is you know, holding on for dear life. He obviously wants to get something passed, whether it's just the infrastructure package, perhaps the reconciliation bill. He wants to show signs of momentum. Uh, but it's impossible at this juncture to see, well, not impossible, very difficult to see how anything substantial gets done between now and next Tuesday when the actual vote takes place. You know, uh, Willie, it is so true uh, what Sam just said. If you look at every poll, we're, we're talking about, I've been talking about the importance of Democrats passing legislation, the infrastructure bill that would give uh, Terry McAuliffe and a lot of Democrats a lift. That's a tactic. Uh, the strategy, though, I mean, the grand strategy for the Biden administration and Democrats, it's got to be one thing, and that is getting COVID in the rearview mirror. That's what's driving every poll. It is, and every poll we've seen has this race deadlocked. I mean, there are no outliers at this point anymore. It's at, they're all statistically tied or, or literally tied. Um, and you're right, COVID education is another big thing. There was a USA Today poll yesterday that showed this question that's been raised by Glenn Youngkin based on a quote from Terry McAuliffe about whether parents should have uh, voices and impact in decisions made in schools. Independents, by and large, say yes, of course, parents should. There's a lot at play here, including Donald Trump. President Biden, as Mika said, was in Virginia last night campaigning for McAuliffe at the rally in Arlington. Biden, who rarely mentions former President Trump, repeatedly criticized the former president. Biden arguing McAuliffe's Republican challenger, Glenn Youngkin, will only further Trump's agenda. Look, how well do you know Terry's opponent? Well, just remember this. I ran against Donald Trump. And Terry is running against an acolyte of Donald Trump. He started his campaign by saying that the number one issue in the race was his call, the election, he called for election integrity. Now, this guy starts it, he's calling for election integrity. Now, why did he do that? Because he wanted to hear Donald Trump? It was a price he'd have to pay for the nomination. And he paid it. But now he doesn't want to talk about Trump anymore. Well, I do. Yeah! Talk about an oxymoron, Donald Trump and election integrity. <laughs> Terry's opponent has made all of his private pledges of loyalty to Donald Trump. But what's really interesting to me 
He won't stand next to Donald Trump now that the campaign's on. <laughs> Think about it. He won't allow Donald Trump to campaign for him in this state. And he's willing to pledge his loyalty to Trump in private. Why not in public? What's he trying to hide? Is there a problem with Trump being here? Is he embarrassed? Look how he's closing his campaign. He's gone from banning a woman's right to choose to banning books written by a Pulitzer Prize and Nobel Prize winning author, Toni Morrison. My wife, Jill, my wife, Jill, went to Princeton to interview her, taught her book. Let's be clear. This is a guy who doesn't know much about anything. Doesn't, wow. <laughs> doesn't know much about all that. You know, Eddie, of course, all over America, they're trying to use critical race theory uh, in places that have never taught critical race theory to scare white voters. I, the Toni Morrison thing mm -hmm. is so funny because I guess Glenn doesn't know a lot of white people across America have Toni Morrison quotes up in their house to inspire their children. <laughs> I mean, that's how extreme it's gotten. I mean, and just how clumsy this whole thing has gotten. Uh, but there is no doubt, even if it was a clumsy, awkward, ineffective plea uh, to racists, it was uh, how Glenn Youngkin decided to end his campaign nonetheless. The horrors, the horrors. <laughs> of Toni Morrison. Indeed. You know, I, I, I've taught Toni Morrison's beloved every year for 20 years. I understand it as one of the classics of American literature is based on actually a true story. Margaret Garner, who escaped slavery in January of 1856, her slave masters followed her into Ohio and decided, acting on the Fugitive Slave Law, to take her back to slavery. And she refused to allow her children to return. And she actually killed one of her children. And so that became the basis of, of, of the novel. But what's fascinating here, Joe, is this is an attempt to stoke white resentment and white fear. And this question around education is an echo in some ways. I know this might seem as a stretch for some, but an echo of the debates around school busing. You remember those images in Boston of someone with a flag attacking some, where there's this sense in which this story around education is about a kind of attack on neighborhoods, an attack on our way of life, an attempt to displace us. And hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.